briefcases, the data and the research that has been done concerning what they have done to us. I'm going to put it here. It is what anybody, come look at it. Anybody want to know why in the world we had an oil spill? Because we're greedy. You know whose fault that is? Ours. Do you know why we have an environmental disaster now? Because of the government. Do you know why they used Corexits? We know why they used the Corexit. We have 31 possible dispersant options to use, but no, we used three of them. Corexit 9527A, 9500, and 9580. All manufactured by Nalco Chemical Company. Nalco Chemical Company, as you heard earlier, is owned by BP. You heard earlier that BP is owned by J.P. Morgan. Well, worse than that, BlackRock Corporation owns J.P. Morgan and BP and Nalco. They are the largest shareholders of BP and Nalco. The decision to use dispersants was not only to cover up BP's oil, but was to also increase their profits at the expense of the environment and human life. Now what we have going on now are scientists trying to get in there to figure out what this toxic stew is going to do. We do not know what this toxic stew is going to do. We have no clue. Noah has no clue. No one has a clue. EPA has no clue. Lisa Jackson states, the use of dispersants was the lesser of two evils. I say, if anyone had asked us in Louisiana, we'd have taken death by oil over death by dispersant. But no one asked us. So what did they do? We have an oil spill that has turned into this putrefaction of our Gulf waters. We have compounded it with the use of dispersants. And now this toxic stew is currently, as we speak, annihilating a good third of the Gulf Coast. Everybody talks about restoration of the Gulf. We are beyond that point now. We will have to reinvent the Gulf. We are killing the deep water coral. The reason we're killing deep water coral is because if coral is exposed to oil alone, it maintains a 96% reproduction rate. If it is exposed to dispersant, it has a 0% reproduction rate. What is this lesser of two evils? I ask you, that makes no sense. We had, we had Norway sitting there with six skimmers off the shoreline ready to help us. BP hid behind the 1920 Jones Act maritime law. Didn't want anybody in there to see what they have done. We had the whale was rejected. The whale that could do 200 million gallons of water per hour. It was rejected. Anyone want to know why it was rejected? It only returned 90% drinking water. 90%. It couldn't do 100%. The gulf wasn't drinkable before we started. How can we judge that 90% return of drinking water is inadequate? That is ridiculous. Again, because BP does not want anyone to know what they have done. Now, here's an education for you. Back in March of 2009, BP put in an exploratory plan for two well sites, the MC-252A and the MC-252B. The MC-252B site is the Deepwater Horizon site, also known as the Macondo Well. Now, the reason it's referred to as the Macondo Well is because it's in the Macondo Reservoir. They did drill at MC-252A site, abandoned that and went to the B site. We have strong evidence indicating that not only is the Deepwater Horizon rig leaking and still leaking, we have evidence that shows that the MC-252A site took a hit and has been spewing out oil as well. Yeah. And we do say that every time we have seen these well-capped attempts, we have seen two separate wells. Two separate wells. That's it. Every time we turn around, it's like things look different. It's like, why does that look different? We all get together and we're like, whoa, what do you see? It's like, well, I see a different well. What do you see? I see a different well. We've had five attempts on one well. I think not. 
Now to add to this mess, we have a well site, the MC-118, which Exxon started to drill, and Exxon got scared. You know why they got scared? 20 to 30,000 PSIs is what they found in the well. Do you know why that scared them? Our technology cannot handle 20 to 30,000 PSIs. They abandoned the well. What does BP do? It says, oh, well, if you can't handle it, Exxon, we'll just get in there and we'll do the MC-252 and A and B sites. So what we have is we have a situation where it was uncontrollable to begin with. These were only exploratory wells. Did anybody know that? These were only exploratory. These were not supposed to be producing wells. And because they classified them as exploratory wells, they were not required to bring in any environmental consultants. They were not required to have a spill response plan because of the exploratory listing. I can go on on that one, but I won't. I'm going to go on to the next thing here. Our illustrious government has gone into business with BP. Obama has approved BP as our number one fuel supplier for our military. Did anybody know that? Okay. I'm just letting you th know things that we find out all the time. All these little lovelies that come along. Now, we're at a point now where the oil is gone. We have fairy tale microbes that automatically have risen up from the deep. And they're eating this oil. And I am so happy. I love fairy tales. But I wish they... <laughs> I love fairy tales. So I would love to stand here and tell you that yes, the oil is gone. I would love to stand here and tell you yes, those microbes exist. But we know at this point that is BS. The fact of the matter is we have, in my briefcase of truth, evidence that 90% of the oil still persists and causes is, 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 and is creating damage to our environment as we speak. Underwater plumes, when asked at NOAA June 23rd about the underwater plumes, they didn't exist. I wish there was a fairy tale along with that one too. We now have the data thanks to the University of Southern Florida, University of Georgia, Tulane University, that absolutely these underwater plumes exist. And they exist anywhere from 40 meters in the water column all the way down to 1,400 meters in the water column. And all of these layers are testing out highly toxic for PAHs and dispersants. All right, so now we got this crap in the water column. Now we have a deep scattering layer. All those critters that can't stand light, they live down there during the daylight, and then they come up to the surface at night to feed all of our wonderful dolphins and birds and top feeders. They're coming up through this toxic cloud every day and then dropping back down. They are dying. As they die, as the coral dies, so does the entire food chain. Yeah. Yeah. Do you understand the implications of this? Do you realize that you enjoyed seafood? 40% of this country's seafood came from the Gulf waters. There's going to be a food shortage, ladies and gentlemen. Beef prices are going to go up. Chicken's going to go up. And chicken does not taste like shrimp. <laughs> Along with these little lovelies that we have going on, we have a series of questions that we have hit BP with. The Joint Information Center at HOMA has been the place where I have called five, six times a day. And every time I call, I get some blow-off answer. One question I asked, are we spraying any dispersants on land? Spraying of dispersants, according to the BP press office, is an urban legend. We've got 14 million people who have witnessed the spraying of dispersants. Witnessed the spraying. We've witnessed the night ops. We have got 
gotten the samples out of the marshes and off the land. We have proven it through the public sector and our researchers that have committed everything they got to fighting this war against BP. We have the evidence. They refuse to acknowledge the evidence. They want to come up with these fairy tale microbes that live in the deep sea. That is not true. Things are dying. What is not dead will be dead in the next two years. That is a guarantee. When they want you to come down and eat the seafood and swim in the water, let me tell you, Tulane University, <laughs> University of Southern Florida, University of Georgia have found evidence that the dispersed oil is bioaccumulating even though NOAA said it was unlikely to bioaccumulate. My question to them was how dare you open up the waters and say the seafood's safe when it based upon unlikely? That was, that was months ago. Now we find out, yes, it is bioaccumulating. It is under the shells of crab larvae. It is in our larval shrimp. Now, what eats our larval shrimp and our larval crabs? Anybody tell me? The entire rest of the friggin' food chain.